Ever wonder why artists create their art? In this series, Crafting a Career in the Arts, The Art of Why, you will hear from Edmonton-based artists from a wide range of disciplines. These artists will share with you why they create, how they use their art form to maintain their mental health, help with a disability, or as a way to connect with their community. We will also feature some of Edmonton's locations and organizations that support the arts in our city. In this episode, you will hear from Edmonton-based digital artist and photographer, Renee, on why she started, where she gets her inspirations, and how she became the artist she is today. My name is Renee Robin and I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. So I'm a photographer and a digital artist and so what I do is I go around the world and I take photographs and then from there I take everything and I put it onto the computer in the fastest summary possible and I combine digital art and photography and I smash them together in a digital space. So a digital artist essentially is an, an artist that works on a, in a digital medium. So they're working on computers or tablets or something like that. They're not working with pencils and paints in the more traditional sense of what we consider art to be. I come from a very artistic family. And so there was, you know, while I was painting and sculpting, my grandmother did pottery. My, you know, family members were writers and illustrators. And so, yeah, I just grew up with pencils in my hands. And then later into us tablets, <laughs> we come tablets. Uh, lots of time outdoors. I mean, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, so, and in the middle of nowhere. So it was outdoors all the time, every chance that we got. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's kind of what the childhood was pre-internet, right? Your parents are just like, get out of the house and, you know, come home when the coyotes start howling or if you live in the city when the streetlights come on. <laughs> so I think I'm very lucky to have that kind of childhood. I grew up on a farm just outside of Shore Park. So it was in the middle of nowhere with like cats and chickens and horses and yeah, lots of, lots of nature. What led me to doing digital composites with photos? Uh, so I mean, I started with photography. My dad traveled around the world when he was young. And so I saw all these photographs of like Mount Everest, you know, from the seventies and Sri Lanka and you know, um, what's the other, Australia, all basically, he, did like a big loop of the planet. And so I grew up living in rural Alberta where it's, you know, wheat fields for as far as you can see and swamps and that's kind of it. <laughs> and then, you know, seeing all these photographs of like faraway places was just so fascinating to me. And, I, but I didn't really pick up photography right away. I mean, I picked it up later in life. I started modeling when I was quite young, um, I got signed to an agency and 11 years into that, I got really bored and I was just like, well, what else can I try that's out there? But not in a space where, you know, it's the, you know, photographs of people, I just didn't care. I had seen so many photographs of people from a modeling career at 11 years at that point, I was just like, I don't, I'm over it. But I had this point and shoot and it had this little flower setting on it, which I later learned is called macro. <laughs> but I was like, it's the flower setting, how cool is that? <laughs> and so, you know, I was taking photographs of like leaves with water drops on them and stuff like that. And it was just really interesting to me. And so that's really where it all started. But what I learned about composite photography is I thought that that started, I started working with Photoshop just for like illustrations and stuff like that when, in about 90, 1997. And, but I never really applied it to photography. But then I was going through some old photo albums. I had moved and I was just like going, you know when you do the big move and you purge everything. I found this photo album from when I was about six. And essentially what I had done is I had taken photographs and I'd done like old school composites with like scissors and I'd cut photos of my cat jumping off the bunk bed and put them jumping into the fish tank. And so I didn't realize that I was doing like really early composites really early on. I had no idea. I mean, I thought that that came later when I was in my mid twenties, but it didn't, it came a lot earlier, I guess. And I was just waiting for the technology to catch up. So my typical day or week, there isn't such a thing as like a typical day or week. Every single week 
is completely different from the last nine out of 10 times. So there's weeks where I'm traveling, where I am in like a different time zone every few days or every few weeks. And then there's weeks where I'm sitting in front of the computer and I'm just working on all the editing. And so I like that there's a lot of a mix. It's not the same thing every single day because I go crazy in that environment. <laughs> so yeah, every single day is a very different adventure. <laughs> For me, composites can really vary from image to image. So sometimes I'll work on an image and I'll get, you know, 15 or 20 done in a week of all these different composites. And then other times, I mean, again, that goes back to the schedule, right? Depending what I'm doing. So if I'm doing a lot of traveling, I'm doing a lot less editing. So I'm doing a lot less digital art. But sometimes, yeah, a composite can take me, you know, eight to 10 hours on average. And then other times it'll take me, I mean, I just finished an image that I've been working on since last year. <laughs> So, what I think people should know about the process of digital art is that it's tedious. <laughs> and I think everyone assumes that until you're really sitting there on like hour, you know, 15 or 20 working on something and going like, why isn't this working? Uh, it's just a very, yeah, it's a very tedious, slow process. And, you know, it's a, a lot of hours sitting in front of the computer once you actually get to the retouching side. And you got to be okay with that and not everyone is. <laughs> I think my biggest artistic influences come from the days of Heavy Metal Magazine back in the 80s and 90s. I mean, if anybody who knows Heavy Metal Magazine knows my work, the influence is pretty obvious. <laughs> it's not, you don't have to dig real hard to find the influence there. But I mean, I, I'm mostly inspired by digital painters and then oil painters and watercolor. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. I find my biggest inspirations come from when I sleep which is weird. I really can't overestimate the value of sleep when you're, when you're a creative person and you're doing this for a living. You know, you need those, those REM hours because yeah, all of my best ideas have come from when I've been asleep. <laughs> a lot of people think, you know, where you grew up and how you grew up really influences your artwork. And for me, it, I mean, in a counterproductive way, I guess it does. I mean, because I'm so inspired to make stuff that's nothing like where I grew up. <laughs> I'm really interested by all of the things that don't exist in reality. So I guess it did and it didn't. <laughs> so my favorite place to take photographs is kind of anywhere. Again, I really love photographing in the studio. I love taking background plates out on locations. Um, it's mostly the conditions that really matter to me. My favorite time to photograph outside is when it's storming. So if it's like crappy weather and like sideways rain or, you know, gale force winds, I love that stuff. That stuff's really great. And then of course I love being in the studio too. So I like to photograph people in the studio and I like to photograph my back plates in the crappiest weather imaginable. <laughs> I was involved in a motorcycle accident. I was riding to work one day and I got hit and uh, knocked off my bike. And when I was on the ground, I got run over. And all of my skills up until that point, I needed my legs and I needed to be strong, right? I worked in the trades. I grew up on a farm. Everything involved being like physically capable and all of a sudden I couldn't do it. Even the modeling, I mean, it's hard to model when you're <laughs> stuck in, a, in an ICU bed. So I was stuck for, you know, six months learning how to walk again. And I was just like, oh my God, what do I do? And I've been taking photographs for fun for a little while. And I was just like, I guess we're going to do professional photography. So in short, I never planned on this, but here we are. <laughs> so I never really used photography as, as a really a method for healing per se, but when I was initially first run over, you know, I went from my entire world being really big and, you know, being physically capable to get anywhere I wanted to, to literally being stuck in a bed. I'd never been bedridden in my entire life. So digital art, not so much photography, but digital art definitely became the escapism for, you know, I would composite myself laying in bed and then I would do digital art to put myself into anywhere else in the world, just because I wanted to be anywhere but there. But as on a day-to-day -day thing, I just make stuff that I think is fun that I get to watch people's interpretations of. So the state that I usually have to be in when I'm creating my best work is I usually just put my headphones on and I can be in a cafe or, you know, it doesn't really matter where I am, but if I've got, you know, music in my ears, I can just sit down and just start working. 
I definitely do my best work when it is, you know, when I'm around people. I'm really extroverted, so a digital arts career is actually very, very poorly suited to a person like me. <laughs> I like to be around people, I like to work with people, so the photography part is definitely the most fun for me, but the digital art side, um, you know, I, I do these little like work dates, you know, call friends over and we all put our headphones in and nobody talks, but we're all getting work done. And that, that is definitely the happiest, <laughs> the happiest time to be doing the work. So I used to be a big time perfectionist, like a lot, and I'm not anymore. <laughs> Life is much happier not being a perfectionist. I used to absolutely agonize over every single moment of it. And I do up into a point, and I'm really good with those boundaries with myself now because there is a line of diminishing returns. If I'm doing a personal project, then, you know, I'll really take the time on it. You know, if it's something that, you know, I've been working on for a year, like I said, that one image I've been working on for the last year. Like, okay, I took my time with that. But 99% of the time, perfection isn't necessarily even noticed by 99% of my clients. So at the end of the day, I have to be able to deliver artwork of a certain quality. And perfectionism really, I found, held me back. So I will work on stuff and go back to it all the time, especially when it comes to personal work. That's definitely a big part of the process is working on it for a little while, leaving it alone, coming back to it, working on it for a little while, leaving it alone, coming back to it. Because especially when it comes, personal work, in my opinion, is made to, those are the projects that are there to make you a better artist. They're not there to deliver to anybody on time, on any schedule other than, okay, I've come to the limit of my skills. Now I need to go learn more skills come back and then reapply them, or I need to you know, get new ideas and then come back and reapply them. So I think that's a very, very important part of my process is the entire thing of just being like, oh, yeah, nope, this looks terrible. We're just gonna put that away. <laughs> We're gonna come back to it later. And then you know, come back to it a few months later, try it again. Okay, yeah, this is starting to look good, starting to look good, oh, no, nope. okay, that sucks. We're gonna stop and we're gonna walk away. So yeah, that's a huge part of the process when it comes to personal work. barriers that I face as a photographer, a digital artist. I think the biggest barrier these days is my body. <laughs> I've got a lot of injuries. Like I said, I was, you know, motorcycle accident and uh, I had a car accident. I was T-boned just over a year ago. And the barrier now is how much it hurts just to carry all the equipment and to, you know, be sitting on the computer all day. And then when I'm traveling with 60 pounds of gear, my body is really not loving this anymore. And so I'm glad, I'm glad that the equipment is getting lighter and lighter all the time, but I don't know if it's getting light enough and fast enough for my decaying body. <laughs> so I'm working on an art book right now. And one of the big projects about this is I want to be able to create this experience that not only is a book experience for people, but a gallery show as well. So I'm working in, within the augmented reality space and that is very interesting to me. And that is ultimately where I would love all of this work to go is into an interactive augmented reality space where we have the real world where you can feel it and touch it and smell it and everything else. And then this augmented digital world. And that is like the happy spot where all of the things that I work in every single day finally come to a real interactive experience. So if anyone knows anyone who likes to do funding, you hit me up. <laughs> I use color to sort of tell stories, not as in depth as what a lot of other people do, but for me, I mean, I'm not using, you know, red means, you know, angry or anything like that. I mostly am interested in using color and how our brains interpret the science of color. So there's a really great book out there by Joseph Albers called The Interaction of Color. And that book has taught me so much on color theory and I love it so much. And I think that was a really big shift in how I color grade my images was understanding the science of how color interacts with each other and then our, how our brain filters all of that information. So I come at it from probably a little bit more of like a scientific perspective than an artistic one. I'm not really sure if my style has changed over time. I think it's just matured and evolved. It's, the stuff I like is the same, it's just better. The stuff that I like to make is still very similar, it's just better. I think the filters in how I'm choosing to cast people and the people that I'm looking for to create these images with is finally becoming 
more mature and I think when you're first starting out in the arts world, a lot of times what people will start with, like, you know, I see this all the time, especially with digital artists where people go, you know, oh, well, they're just like young and, and pretty and, you know, the, the everlasting elves and they always look 25 and under. And, you know, you could do that for a while and whatever, but eventually, I mean, for myself, I got really bored. And so I've really reached out into a more, a more diverse cast of characters and the things I can create with them. Like I love creating artwork with women who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, right? And the characters that I can create with them because their faces have so much story. Same with men, right? Um, you know, working within the LGBTQ community as well, you know, drag kings, drag queens, like being able to create characters with people who live those lives, I think really opens up the type of visual stories that I'm able to tell now. And I think that is a lot more interesting. So that's probably the biggest way that there's been evolution. I think digital art benefits photography in my world because what I like to make doesn't exist anywhere or it's not easily accessible or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I think digital art makes photography more interesting for me. Uh, what I can see with the camera, what I can capture with the camera, no matter how amazing it is, for me is just never going to feel good enough or interesting enough. And maybe that says a lot about who I am as a person. But if, yeah, if I can capture it within, in a single shot, I'm always left going, well, what else could there be? But digital art kind of helps tide that over for me where I get to say, you know, oh, this is, this is so cool. Look at this like amazing photograph that we have. And then I can take all these digital art skills and I can make it far more interesting. Photography mostly has the most positive impact on my mood when I get to get into the studio and I get to, you know, be in there and somebody gets to see themselves through my eyes for the first time, which is always really interesting because I shoot tethered to the computer. So my camera talks to the computer and then that talks to the TV. And, you know, lots of people, especially if they're not experienced with being photographed. And they, I mean, even if they are, how I like to perceive people and how I like to structure them with lighting and with posing and with styling and everything. The first time they see the image come up that they love of themselves on screen is always just so cool. It's always kind of like this really magical moment, especially, you know, I have friends who've never been photographed before ever in their lives. And they look there and they look at the screen and they're going, what? <laughs> like, how is that me? How is that me? And, you know, it's like, well, that is you. Like, there's, there's no trickery. There's, not, there's no computer. There's no digital art yet or anything. It's just lenses and light and styling. And that is always the biggest highlight for me. Creating fantasy is really important to me just because how much more interesting it could be if, you know, we had wings or we didn't have to pay taxes all the time or like, <laughs> you know, all the, the boring stuff about life. I mean, why do we love reading fantasy so much, right? I mean, why do we love playing video games? Why do we, there's always something about our brains where we're always looking for more, for better or worse. And, you know, fantasy for me kind of helps fill those little cracks in my brain. I think photography and digital art matter overall in the same way that doing anything creative matters. I think whatever gets people more interested in being creative and gets people more access to ways to communicate what's within their brain is important. So whether it's photography, whether it's digital art, whether it's sculpting, it, it doesn't really matter so long as it's a way for people to express themselves creatively. And photography and digital art is getting cheaper and cheaper and more accessible all the time. And therefore, and I mean, it inherently connects to the internet, therefore it connects us to these communities all over the world. And having art that connects us to other people, I think is really the height of creative expression. I think if anyone from the future was to see my work 100 years from now, I would hope that they would think it was an interesting expression of you know, what a childhood was that you grew up without digital art and then growing up into the, you know, the video game world and the fantasy novel world, and you know, which is my youth and, and the youth of millions of others. And hopefully that expression into digital art is an interesting one because no matter what type of art that we make, eventually it's gonna look dated. So my work is going to look like this time period. And I really wonder how it compares to art from 100 years from now.
if you're first getting into photography, the easiest way to do it is, is online courses. And I, I sell courses, but also there's courses all over the internet that you can, you can YouTube for free. You can, you know, take classes in person. You can go to workshops, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's just getting out there with your device and using it as often as you can. I mean, with any of these things, you know, we can practice this stuff anywhere. You know, it's just a matter of picking it up and getting really comfortable with it. Whatever way that is, that makes sense to you. Things I wish that I knew before when I started. I wouldn't really change anything because everything that I learned along the way was a part of the process to get me to where I am now. So I really probably wouldn't change anything other than how much I hate paperwork then is how much I hate paperwork now. <laughs> That's never changed. <laughs> So when it comes to artwork, there's so many different types of creativity that I've tried over the years and I would still like to try. And I mean, 3D is a big one. I think if anyone, if they're really getting into this for the first time and you want to do this professionally and commercially, not necessarily like, you know, you want to take family photos, but you want to work in a commercial advertising space, I would definitely say get really comfortable with 3D. And I, that is one area that I would absolutely love to have more time in my day to practice to get good at is exploring the 3D space. So after my book is finished, I'm not really sure what's next. I mean, with the advent of AI technology, I mean, an AI, AI art, that got a lot better, a lot faster than I thought it was going to. I, ha I thought I had another two years to kind of try and figure out what the implications of AI was going to mean to my career and it's here now already, and it's really good. And so I don't actually know what the future is anymore. I have no idea because there are literally apps out there that can do a better job than I can faster, you know? And it's amazing. It's, it's, a lot of AI art kind of sucks, but there's a lot of AI, AI art that is very compelling and it's beautiful and it's incredible for ideas and everything else, but it really does, um, kind of put me out of work. So I don't actually know. I have no idea anymore. And uh, for people going into the field, I don't really have answers for them either, other than if you're going to go into this field as a profession, do it because you love it for as long as possible, not because it's a way to earn a living. Do it because it's something inside of you that you need to do. Next, please join Catherine from the Art Gallery of Alberta as she discusses the history of the AGA, the importance of local artwork, and the AGA's role in Edmonton's art scene. My name is Catherine Croston, and I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Curator at the Art Gallery of Alberta, and in that role, I have oversight for all of the management and administration of the gallery, but also for the artistic direction of the program and the collection. The AGA is the Art Gallery of Alberta. We are the oldest cultural institution in the province of Alberta. We were founded in 1924, which means we'll be celebrating our 100th anniversary in 2024. We are an art gallery, a public art gallery that features exhibitions. We have a large permanent collection, and we also animate our exhibitions with education programs, public programs, and community outreach. The mission of the AGA is to connect art, people, and ideas. And one of the things that we find so fascinating about working in the visual arts is that many people think it's just visual, but in fact, there are so many ideas that go behind the creation of a work of art. Uh, so many concepts and ideas and life experiences of the artist, but also of the things that the artists are representing. So for us, art really speaks to uh, history, to culture, to lived experience, and those are the things that we type, try to bring to the exhibitions to share with people. The AGA is unique because we offer a wide range of exhibitions. We try to bring art uh, that's both contemporary and historical. We also feature artists from Alberta, but also artists from across Canada and around the world. We're really proud of the depth and breadth of our program in terms of the types of work we represent. We represent and show work in all media from paintings and sculptures to video. So it's a really, I think, unique opportunity to see a wide variety of different types of art made by artists from all around the world. It's really important, I think, that people can see art that's made by artists in their community. Artists are the kind of windows onto the world for many people, and people see things not only that represent the world they live, but also have them see the world in a different way through the eyes of the artists. 
So I think it's really important that people know that there are artists in their community, that artists contribute to the life of the cities in which we live and the country in which we live. And they really are um, providing us a new way of looking at the world and a new way of experiencing many things that we maybe might not see or might take for granted. We change our exhibitions quite frequently. The AGA has three different exhibition floors and we have two, two or three different galleries on each floor. And we change the exhibitions every three months. So when you come to the AGA, it's likely that you're always going to see something new. Um, we feature about 18 different exhibitions a year, some designed specifically for children, some that look at Canadian historical art, some that look at contemporary art. So I think that we really try to keep things fresh and new, and there's always something different to see when you come to the AGA. Yes, it's interesting. We have a space that's dedicated to emerging artists, the RBC New Works Gallery. We also feature exhibitions that showcase emerging artists in Alberta, such as the Alberta Biennial of Contemporary Art. Uh, but at the same time, we feature old masters. So you could come here and you could see work by an 18-year-old artist from Edmonton at the same time as that you could see Rembrandt paintings. So it's a, a way of showcasing all of the different types of art that have been made you know, both here in a city contemporaneously, but also from around the world from many different times. Our permanent collection has about 6,500 works of art in it right now. It's largely a Canadian collection. We've been collecting art since the 1920s when the gallery was formed. I think some of the earliest works in the collection of Canadian historical work date from the late 19th century. One of our oldest works, however, is a, a, a Shiva that came to us from India. It's a sandstone sculpture that dates to the 5th century AD. And we really try now to represent Western Canadian artists. We have a little strong focus on artists, obviously, from Alberta, but also from across Western Canada. And then we also try to collect works from American artists and European artists that support a kind of core representation of art history, so that when people look at our collection, they'll be able to find examples of, for instance, uh, small examples of French Impressionism or examples of abstract art from the United States and New York and artwork that has really impacted and informed how artists create work in Alberta as well. The building was designed by an LA-based architect named Randall Stout. We did an international competition when we were working on the, the design of the new building and Randall won that competition. When he first came to Edmonton, he was inspired by a couple of things. He was very fortunate to be able to see the Aurora Borealis. Uh, but he is also interested in the way the North Saskatchewan River kind of organically weaves and cuts through the very rigid city grid of Edmonton. So when you look at the building, one of the things that is its primary feature is the light column, which was supposed to kind of evoke the northern lights. And the window design that you can see in the main hall with the grid of windows with the kind of sinuous sink curve that rolls through it is a real representation of how that river cuts through the city and it really looks like a kind of map of Edmonton when you look at the building. It's a unique building in that it has very, very curvilinear organic forms, but also very regular spaces for the galleries themselves. Well, one of the things that we find is that oftentimes people learn in different ways. And one of the ways people learn about art is by making art. So we do offer a variety of different ways that people can take hands-on courses where they actually learn the techniques and skills of making art. One of those is the Art Hive, which we do offer through St. Stephen's College and the University of Alberta. And that space is supposed to be a safe, friendly base where people can come and feel open to be creative, to create new things, to kind of find meanings through making art. And we also offer drop-in art classes for adults as well as a whole series of art classes for children. So we really do believe that you know, the part of the experience of the gallery is not just walking and seeing art, but also being able to experience the making of it as well. The program direction of the gallery really is to provide people with a broad and vast understanding of different types of art from different times and different places. And I think we all know, if we think of our lives, everybody wants art in their life in some way, whether it's a calendar in their house or a, a print from a shop or an artwork or a painting that your children made. And I think that that's something that we really want people to understand, is that people make art and see art and appreciate art for all sorts of different reasons and all sorts of different types of art have meaning for people. So that's, I think, one of the roles that we have is to bring that type of art to people so that they don't need to necessarily travel abroad or travel to a large city. They can experience art from around the world right here in Edmonton. I think one of the main things that people should know is that the art and exhibitions here is always changing, that they may come to the gallery one day, see an exhibition of Canadian historical art, come another month later and see an exhibition of Rembrandt. 
so that every time they come, there'll be something new. And every time they might find something that they really love and truly appreciate and learn from, sometimes things might leave them wondering and a little bit curious and uncertain. But I think that's part of the role that we play, is to have people question, to have people think for themselves, to create meaning from what they see, and to see this place as a place of open and creative thinking that allows them to have that experience. With the increased popularity of AI, it may be that some artists are questioning their career or what their future might be. But I think one thing we really have to keep in mind is that art is an idea, but it's also something that's made by an individual. It's often made by hand. It often has characteristics that you can't replicate in a computer. And I think the most important thing for artists to think about is that everything they make is unique to them and it's unique to the world in which we live. And so AI is a tool, I think, that can be used to reproduce and to generate things, but it can't take the place of human creativity.